a question I often think about now is, as Silicon Valley, are we programming apps or are we programming people? We're constantly hearing about how addicted we are to our screens, that they're making us more stressed out, less focused, less human. And with that, we're also beginning to hear about the very people who created our online worlds expressing regret. So what's it like for these newly black sheep of Silicon Valley and for their kids and a new generation of young people growing up outside of technology? And what kind of wake-up call is this for the rest of us? Good morning, second grade. You know, at the beginning of my career, I thought that just by introducing the internet to more people, that that would inherently make the world better. And the reason why I went through depression is the realization that that's not the case. putting all of humanity into the largest psychological experiment that we've ever done, and there's no control. It's the biggest persuasion and addiction machine ever built. This is Aza Raskin, inventor of many things, but among them, one of the most essential parts of our online experience, the infinite scroll. So scrolling already means I haven't found what I want, so just show more. At the time I invented it, there was all those little more buttons at the bottom. Why? Obviously, it's a better solution to just, if you get near the bottom, just load some more and load some more and load some more. You're just giving people what they want, right? Well, now it's showing you what you can't help but look at. But the thing, honestly, that I, I regret most about Infinite Scroll is that, yeah, I was just full-throated in support, I mean, like this is just a better design. And so I went around to Twitter and I went around to Google and I gave talks and I said, guys, use this interface. And what was missing was any ethical or moral framework that went with it to be like, all right, how is this actually gonna be used out in the real world? You would hope that the people who are designing these products are people who have thought deeply about the impacts of what they're making Almost always, it's somebody in their 20s, most likely who's gone to an elite school, who's now using like this incredible wealth of knowledge that they have to get you to do something which is in their interest. And you were part of that? Yep. It's really telling that the top Silicon Valley executives don't let their kids use the technology that they create. You know, there are only two industries that call their customers users. One is technology companies, the other are drug dealers. So there's schools here like Waldorf School where a lot of tech executives send their kids and there's not much screen time. In fact, they make a point of having the children not use the screen because you know, face-to-face -face interaction is a skill that you have to learn. There are over 150 Waldorf schools in the US and the first, in Germany, opened a century ago. So, the philosophy embraces experiential, holistic learning. And this one, in Manhattan, was North America's first. Now, full disclosure, I, your journalist, went here more than a decade ago, at a time when smartphones were still just a dream. And this? <laughs> we didn't have this when I was in high school. I remember definitely like, the first month we didn't have our phones, I'd be like, oh, and like, it felt there. It pushes us to talk with other people and use our own perspectives and our own way of thinking instead of just following what everyone else is doing. Literally following. Yeah, literally. It's like following, <laughs> yeah. Our abundance of resources to help them. Jacob, who came to Steiner in high school, and Isa, who's attended since kindergarten, are both in the 11th grade. We have significant blind spots when it comes to what we will consider to be appropriate solutions. You don't use a computer till ninth grade. First through 
eighth grade, everything is handwritten. You use your colored pencils, your crayons, your fountain pen, so. You have to create your own textbook and your own way of learning. And this is Anahata in the second grade. Do you have a cell phone? No. Do you want a cell phone? Not really. Why not? I'm not gonna be talking to my friends and playing with them. I'm just gonna be sitting around and looking at my phone and you know. Like my friend Isabel, she already has a phone. And? And she's so addicted to it. Once I had her played it for like two hours and she was on her phone, like it was pretty boring. We go outside every day and everybody's on their phone. Nobody's really interacting. So it's, we just interact together, you know. It's pretty regular, but it's kind of weird. There are more and more former technology insiders coming out and saying this is not the way it should be. A few years ago, ASA co-founded a nonprofit, the Center for Humane Technology, with Tristan Harris, an ex-Google employee. So how do our companies make money? How much do you pay for your Facebook account? Well, oh yeah, you don't, you don't pay anything. So, so what are you giving them? You're giving them your time, your attention. What most people don't understand is there are teams inside of all of these companies, from the, every app that you use, that's called a growth team. Um, and it's their job to find out how to make the apps more viral, right? We just were like, ah, oh, my phone just notified me, cool. You don't realize how much thought has gone behind that. Like, why is it that when you show up on YouTube, think you're just gonna watch one video, that you end up being stuck there and it's like an hour and a half later when you come out of your trance? Well, it's not happening by chance. We get to see this one perspective that's like, you know, be your own person, you don't need to rely on media, do what you want to do, but then we also have another perspective because, you know, at some point we leave the school building. I mean, even going to Steiner, going to a Waldorf school, still doesn't protect you from all these pressures because you're still a high school student. There's so many different things that it's like, okay, you should be wearing this, you should look like this, you should think like this. It's very hard to be able to say, no, I don't, I don't want to do that, I want to be my own person. I've never really been one to like blindly agree, and I think that I am like that because of being told that it's okay to have your own opinion and you don't have to like agree with what everyone else is saying. Most kids our age definitely don't have that. Yeah. Over 55% of plastic surgeons in the U.S. report having seen at least one patient that comes in asking to look like their Snapchat filter. As we try to get your attention, we invent these interfaces which end up modifying people's identities. Technology has the ability to uplift and upgrade our humanity. Wikipedia is an incredible example of this. All of our technology could feel more like Wikipedia, and yet, because that's not the thing that fits the business model, across the entire spectrum of what it means to be a human being, these products may be free, but actually, they're, they're costing us everything. And that's all. It's a great way to <laughs> connect with people and like to see everybody's different opinions. Ooh. But I can just see it slowly happening. It's going to start to get harder to face the uncomfortable moments or to mm. look someone in the eye. And as people lose the ability to like be present, I think you also lose a bit of yourself and you also can lose the ability to empathize with another person and that's very scary. We need to try to use it in a positive way and not let the technology control us. We need to control the technology. I think it's going to be like a big eye-opener to see the world outside of Steiner. But on the other hand, I feel like 
that same space that kind of like nurtured you, helps you when you go out into the world because you'll bring that there. So, the people in the know see this as an educational utopia worth investing in. And yet, the mainstream still hasn't caught on. Whether it's feeling overloaded and burned out and having our relationships diminished, our ability to read books, to have conversation, when all of these things get downgraded, like, that's not the humanity we want to be. So if we take a clear-eyed, compassionate look at who we are, then we can start to design to include those frailties. If we make that one shift as an industry, then we can be part of the solution and not part of the problem. I actually think it was the process of going through depression to be able to see the world a little bit more clearly. Like you need to go through grief to create space to do something new. And I think Silicon Valley is still in that part of that grief cycle where we're in denial. Next up, we turn to our doctors, our hospitals, to cure us when we're sick. But how can we be cared for by an institution that itself is ill? Find out in episode three.